I almost said this evening. I guess that's just jet lag, don't you think? <laughs> well, we're going to be uh, wrapping up our study. And, and our study, uh, you know, this, if we hadn't been on vacation, we would have started Advent messages today. But vacation kind of bumped everything out of whack. You know how that all goes. But uh, we want to wrap up the, the little book of James today. And, and our topic, sometimes they have to reboot. So, yeah. Don't we all? Yes. <laughs> oh. Let's see my reboot. You know, the thing that I was amazed about while we were in Europe, okay, was uh, all these beautiful medieval Gothic churches. They're, they're magnificent, the stained glass. But uh, there was one difficulty. They didn't have many people. Uh, Attendance was dropping out. Uh, when we were at Strasbourg, I, I went to every church. I even went to some churches when the rest of the group did, and I, I went to them all, I took pictures. I, I like to do that. And there was another minister uh, on the trip, and I, I went to the other minister after being in the one church, and I said, forgive me, for I have sinned. <laughs> they said, what? I said, yeah, the sign said, don't take any pictures. I did anyway. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I, I, uh, there's something about the how majestic and all. But you know, the church, the church is not a building. We are the church. You know, and, and as spectacular as these buildings were, uh, we the people. Jesus said, I will build my church. He wasn't talking about edifices, he was talking about people. And uh, so I'm glad to be a part of what God is doing. When sickness strikes, that is my topic today, uh, I'm going to jump right into the text. It says in James, is anyone, any, any uh, one of you in trouble? My name's Dennis the Menace. <laughs> I know what it's like to be in trouble. Trouble just somehow seemed to follow me everywhere. He says, any of you in trouble, he should pray. I did a lot of praying. So I get in trouble and I'd be praying down to the principal's office at school. You know what I'm saying, trouble? Yeah, okay. It, I like the way the New Living Translation puts this. Are any of you suffering hardships? Hardships. I don't know what your hardship is. Maybe you got a hardship with, uh, you know, on the job. Maybe you got a hardship financially. Maybe you have a hardship with your health. Maybe you have a hardship emotionally. Uh, things just aren't, aren't going well in your life. You're just, you're down, you're depressed. I don't know what the hardship is. He says, you should pray. That's what the idea of trouble is. He says, if any of you are having trouble, he should pray. Now, he says, now, is, is any of you, anyone, happy? Let him sing songs of praise. That's why we have a song service. The first part of our worship service is for those of you who are happy to lift up your voice in songs of praise. Now, somebody said, well, look at here. Right in the Bible, it tells us we should be doing praise music. Actually, it's um, hymns of praise. Uh, actually, it's not even hymns of praise. It's psalms of praise. You see, in the early church, they went to the book of the Psalms. We, they called it the Psalter. And they, they would sing from the book of the Psalms. And he's saying there, you, there's a section of praise songs. They're Hillel songs. Well, praise songs that you sing those. He says, if you're happy, sing happy songs unto the Lord. Then he says, is any one of you sick? Any one of you sick? Actually, it's talking about a pretty, pretty severe sickness. This is not your sniffling cold that he's talking about. He's talking about a person here, he's going to later say, they're actually reclined, they're, they're lay, laying down, man. They, they're weak, they're, they're, they're really sick. He said, any of you really sick, what's he say to do? Here's a prescription. It's a prescription, is pray. Pray for the seriously Sick person. Is any one of you sick? I looked it up. It means to be weak, feeble, to be without strength, powerless, to be sick. When you're sick, he says, you should call for the elders. I find it very interesting uh, that people expect the church to know when you're sick. No, you've got to let us know. <laughs> Call for the elders. It's really hard to do a visitation on a sick person when you don't know they're sick. The first thing you got to do is you call to the church. 
The second thing is you call for the elders of the church. Now, in our case, we technically have one elder because this is a technical position. He's called pastor, he's called elder, he's called overseer or bishop. These three terms are used for the same individual in the scripture. I could prove that from Acts chapter 20, 1 Peter chapter 5, but we're not going to go through all the proof verses. It's just the same person. In our church here, our deacons function more like the elders in the Bible than they do like the deacons of the Bible. Because they meet with me every other week. We're for prayer, consultation. We do spiritual formation. Uh, they, they act more like the elders. And so in a certain sense, they're like the elders of our church. You call for these people, he says. And he says, to pray. The elders are to pray. The idea here is the person's so sick, they, they can't pray. You remember in the uh, Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2, there was a man who uh, was a crippled, he could, couldn't go see Jesus, so his four friends put him on a mat, carried him to see Jesus. And, and then they climbed up on the roof, they tore up the roof because there's such a crowd they couldn't get in. They, they dropped the man down into Jesus, and the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, not his faith, their faith. There's sometimes you're so sick, you can't pray. And you need somebody else praying for you. You call and say, listen, I, I can't pray. I need you to pray. And notice what it says. You pray over him. It's like the person's reclined. They're, they're really ill. They're really sick. Most of the time, we do this kind of praying at the hospital. I get a call. Somebody's at the hospital. I go. And I pray over them. What's to pray? This is God's prescription. Elders are to pray. And it says, pray with this anointing and anointing him with oil. Anointing. I put anointing in there, so just anoint, because it actually is a part of civil. And anointing him. It's like, while you're, do, while you're doing the praying, anoint with oil. Now, the, the question is, what does this mean to anoint with oil? I checked the, the Greek New Testament word here, and the word actually is, is, that is used here is alepho, alepho. I say that because in a moment we're going to see another kind of word that's used for anointing. But this word is used for rub as to apply medicine. And, and we use oil, specifically uh, olive oil, other oils, all kinds of oils, and all kinds of medicinal usages. It's, it's actually used to rub. And I looked up, and there are a lot of uh, things like oil of Olay and different things like that that actually have where did they get that name from? Oil. They, they, they originated with oil. There's oil in it. There's a medicinal value to it. And, and I really think that because of the choice of the word here, he's saying you pray while you're applying the medicine of the day. You know, some people believe that you don't use medicine. I believe God told us we're to use medicine. There's two words for healing in the New Testament. The one is therapeuon. We get the word therapy from it. Isn't that interesting? When Jesus would heal somebody therapeuon, he touched them and he healed them. That's where we get therapy. You, you, you actually have to touch. There's therapy involved. The other word is iomai, and it means to beget life, to put life, to infuse life. Jesus would often say, go, your son is healed. And he didn't even go touch him or anything. And the word there is Ioma. He did it from a distance. He, he exerted his divine power. Now, I don't have that. <laughs> but I do know about therapists, all kinds of therapists. You see what I'm saying? The Bible teaches the use of medicine. It, it says they're applying this, this medicine. Now, the other word for anoint is what you would do in a ceremony for a king or a priest. You would take some oil and you would pour it on their head. There's actually a psalm in the Old Testament where a high priest is being anointed and it's dripping down through his hair onto his beard and onto his garments. When they anointed, they really poured it on. You're being anointed with oil. You're being consecrated. You're ceremonially being dedicated. You're dedicated to a certain act, to a certain position. The word that is used here is not creo, the ceremonial one. Mm -mm. The one that is used here is a lepho, the rub, apply medicine kind of word. In fact, it tells us, Jesus says this, but when you fast, he said, don't go around sullen, looking like, oh, you're, you know, because you haven't eaten, you know, that you look 
and feel terrible. He said, you don't want anybody to know. So he said, you put oil on. Make your, refresh yourself. Make yourself look good. This is, this is a, anoint yourself and wash your face. In another place, you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? It's, this story comes up so often because it's so practical in our lives. The poor Samaritan, the, the, the poor Jewish guy gets beat up by thieves. The Levite and the priest go by. They don't do anything. But the good Samaritan, he stops by. It's his enemy. And he sees the man all beaten up. He's bruised. He's probably got cuts and wounds. And the text says, when he went to him and bandaged his wounds, he poured on oil. What? This is medicine. He's treating his patient the best that he can. And wine. Well, wine was used as an anesthetic. It was used, to, you know, to, to actually clean, to purify. So he's, he's using the medicine of the day in order to, to help the man. You know why? There's no value except the Lord is in it. I just want to say that. In the Old Testament, we saw this when we were going through the book of Exodus. The Lord's name is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, the healer. For I am the Lord who heals you. Who heals you. Now, he uses the word medicinal usage versus the word for ceremonial. So it's not a ceremony. It's not that the pastor comes in when you're in the hospital and he does some kind of religious rite and ceremony like there's some hocus pocus in here. He comes in, and this is how I pray often, God, make what the doctors are doing here effective. They can diagnose, they can get prognosis, they, they, they can do treatment and therapy, and, and, and they can do radiation, they can do all sorts of things, but you know what they can't do? They cannot make your body heal. That's why it works on some and not others. If it worked on everybody every single time, then we know that it wasn't. But why? I pray that God will be Jehovah Rapha, the healer. And use our methods. I call them primitive methods. Because you realize what the methods are going to be like a thousand years from now, if man lives that long, and if uh, the Lord tarries that long in his coming. They're going to look back at us and say, man, were they, look, look what they did to each other. But God, God is gracious to use what we do to each other, okay? And answer to our prayer. Why? We pray asking him to use the means that are necessary. Here's the key ingredient to the prayer. It's the elder's faith. And the prayer offered in faith. Who's been praying? He said, call for the elders. The elders pray. The elders prayer, he says, that's the key ingredient. The elders need to have faith in the true and living God. That's why you call them. You call that the, the person to pray. I, I was one time called to go to the hospital. I went to the hospital, and one of the members of our church, she was, she was an elderly lady, had suffered a stroke, she was in a wheelchair, always sat in the very back left-hand side and in the overflow area of our sanctuary. And I'd go in every week, and I'd give her a hug. She always kissed me. Okay, always kissed me. I got kissed every week. Nobody else in church, but she kissed me. Sometimes my wife, but she always kissed me. I go to the hospital and she's, she's so afraid. She said, I'm so afraid I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I don't know. Every now and then you get this prompting from the Spirit of God. And I don't know where it came from. I said, you're not going to die. I kind of shocked myself. You're not going to die. She said, how do you know I'm not going to die? I said, you are way too scared to die. I said, you're a Christian. It tells us in the word of God, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. When, when death is so close, it's casting a shadow and you're in the darkness of the shadow. He says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I said, no, no, you're way too scared to die. I said, so I prayed with her. She had peace. She went in surgery, came out just fine. She was an elderly lady. About a year later, she was ill again, and this time, uh, while she was ill, she told her daughter, she said, you know what, I'm ready to go. You see the difference? I'm ready to go. And so, uh, 
I, I, I did the funeral after she did die. And I just tell the story that um, the prayer of faith, and I don't know why I got that, that prompting from the Spirit just then. Boom, I prayed it. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. It's effective. It's effective. The prayer of faith is effective. That's what it is. It's effective for wellness. It will make the person well. Not the surgery. Not the therapy. The prayer of faith. Even, even the field of medicine realizes that people who have prayer get well better than people who don't. Now, they can try to psychoanalyze that whole thing and, you know, they try to take the God factor out of it and say, well, it's just a positive attitude, da da da, da. But they realize, and hospitals today are encouraging more of that to go on, that prayer. Even from the person who's not a believer, they say there's something to it, but we, even, they, they, even though they discount it, I know that it's God. You know that it's God. He will answer that prayer and he'll make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. What? Not the prayer. The Lord raises him up in answer to the prayer of the elder who was called. So you got to call so he can pray in faith so that the Lord will actually bring wellness and raise you up. You see the sequence there? It's just that that's the way it works. Now he puts a little if in there. Whoop. The prayer is effective for forgiveness. He says, if he has sinned. It doesn't say because he has sinned. Listen. He will, for, he will be forgiven. If he has sinned. Not because. But if he has sinned. He will be forgiven. Not all sickness is related immediately to sin. <clears throat> to some immediate sin. In John chapter 9. There was a man who was born blind. And the disciples walked by. And he was begging. And Jesus was there. And they said. Master to Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Whose fault is it? See, they equated every sickness with, you did something wrong in your life. And Jesus said, no, neither has this man sinned nor his parents sinned. Now he's talking about immediate consequences. The truth is, none of us would have ever died, had blindness or anything, if Adam and Eve had not committed sin in the garden, and we would not have been a fallen human race. So ultimately, all sickness, all disease, all death goes back to Adam. But he's saying an immediate case here. He said, what's the immediate cause? He said, it was neither him nor his parents. And he says, but that you might see the works of God. Then Jesus did something. He became the great physician. He spit on the ground. Mixed the dirt and his spit together and made a mud. I solve. Is this what your doctor does? Put it in his eyes. Rub it around. Uh, now that's therapy. You see what's going on here? And he said to the man, now go wash. I mean, th that's his part. He's exercising faith. Jesus told me to go wash. He goes to wash. And then he came back seeing. And you read the rest of John chapter 9, the whole story, how he just testified what Jesus did in giving the sight to the blind. All right? But Jesus tells us something very important in this passage. He was not sick because he had sinned. It was for the glory of God. It was for the glory of God. Paul, the great champion of the faith, says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, that he had asked the Lord three times to remove the thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. Most people, most theologians think it was some kind of disease or sickness. Perhaps malaria or something he had gotten while he was in his missionary journeys. But he prays that the Lord would take it away. Three times. Some think it's just his bad eyesight that he's blind. Because at one place, uh, he says, see how I'm writing with such a large hand? Well, that's because I, I can't, that's the only way I can see what I'm writing. Uh, there, the whole point is, the Lord said... My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taking that away. Paul says, you know why I left it? So that I wouldn't brag. Because he said, I saw this revelation from God, and God left this with me so that would always be reminded, I'm just the dust of the earth. Don't puff yourself up so much, buddy. God gave you this great revelation of Jesus Christ. And don't think that you're better than everybody else. You get sick just like everybody else gets sick. You're one of us. 
Now, some sickness is related to an immediate sin. I know that from the the Lord's Supper table. In the church at Corinth, they were abusing the Lord's Supper table, and he says, for anyone who eats and drinks from the Lord's Supper table, without recognizing the body of our Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. We're to prepare our hearts. The text says, before this verse, it says, you examine your heart to make sure everything's right between you and God before you take of the elements. He says, for anyone who doesn't do that, you don't examine your heart. You're not, you're not in right relationship with God. You're, you're asking God to bring judgment upon you. And this is what he says, that is why. Many among you are weak and sick. And a number of you have fallen asleep. The word fallen asleep is a a euphemism. He's speaking kindly about death because when a Christian dies, there's no sting in death. We're just transitioning from this life to the next. And and so he's saying here, but listen, some people are sick because they have sin in their lives and God is doing, he's intruding in time with some immediate judgment uh, on that particular sin saying, hey, listen, you need to confess your sin. In fact, that's what the text goes on to say here. Prayer is effective with confession. We don't talk about confession too much anymore. It's one of those politically incorrect things to say, hey, you're sinning and you need to confess your sin. <laughs> because we don't want to talk. Calling someone a sinner, I mean, that's very judgmental. Uh, He said, therefore, confess your sins to each other. When was the last time that happened? Even in small groups today, one of the biggest barriers, well, nobody really shares from their heart. We we don't, if if I can't confess the good things in my life with other people, how in the world am I going to confess my sins? You know why? I don't trust them. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. And John, the apostle, said this. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's why when you examine yourself before the Lord's Supper table, You confess in your heart to God what you know that you have done to offend Him. And if you do, He is faithful and just and He will purify, He'll cleanse you and you will walk away from the Lord's Supper table so clean, so pure. You'll you'll walk away knowing that you're in proper relationship with God. He says on on the side there, there that Peter wrote, he says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's some times when you can't pray for yourself. You, you, have to, you have to share your request and somebody else prays for it. And it says, why would I do that? Why, why in the world would I tell somebody else? He says, because the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. It's powerful and effective. So he illustrates it. He says, listen, there's this guy by the name of Elijah in the Old Testament. You can look him up in the Kings. Elijah was a man just like us. What? Just like me? He said, we take Bible characters and we elevate them up. We take a pastor and we elevate them up and say, oh, if I could just be like him. You see what I'm saying? No, no, he was just like us. He had the same passions as we did. But what he did is he he prayed. He prayed earnestly that it, it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Now that's a prayer. That's a prayer. He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. The key to this is he prayed earnestly. He really meant what he prayed. He was persistent. He prayed earnestly. Sometimes we we treat prayer like a, a vending machine. I put my prayer coin in, pull it out, and I get my answer, but... Now, he really believes, I'm praying and God is going to do something. It's like that day I prayed for that lady. I don't know where that came from. You're not going to die. Because then, my, afterward I'm saying, 
well, what if she does die? I just gave her false assurance. And that's a doubt. Rather than saying, you know what? God prompted my heart. I prayed. And she lived. It's the earnest, genuine prayer of faith that he's talking about. You probably don't know this guy. His name is George Mueller. You might know his name. George Mueller was a man known for prayer. He ran an orphanage in England, and I believe it was in London, and uh, ran out of food. And he had everybody set the table, all the kids, and they sat down to pray. And he said, Lord, bless the food that you're about to, we are about to partake of. There's no food. Next thing he knows, there's, by the time he gets to the end of his prayer, there's a knock on the door. The bread wagon lost its wheel and collapsed and said, hey, we got all this bread. Uh, we're not going to make it to the market. Can you use it? He brought it in, and there was the bread on the table. He was coming to America, and on his way to actually Quebec, um, and uh, on the ship, it got caught in a, a terrible fog, and he had an appointment that when they were arriving, should be the next day, but the captain of the ship slowed it down. He slowed it down, because uh, he did not want to run into icebergs or anything like that. So George Mueller went to the, the captain and said, Captain, what's going on here? I got an appointment tomorrow. I have never missed an appointment in my whole life. I have a very important appointment tomorrow. And he said, hey, listen, I am not going any faster. We're, you're going to have to delay your, your meeting. And, and he said, well, let's go, let's go up to the chart room and pray. So George Mueller went up to the chart room with him and prayed. And George Mueller got down on his knees and he prayed that God would lift the fog and so they could make his appointment on time. And uh, when he got done, the, the captain started to pray. He said, stop. You don't believe that he will, and I believe he already has. Got up and the fog was gone. This is earnest praying, genuinely believing, earnestly, throwing your whole heart into it. You really believe that God is going to answer your prayer. He gives us some final reminders about prayer. He says, pray for the backslider. You all know somebody who was once strong in the faith or once strong in church or who was once uh, living for God and has seemed to wander away. My brothers, if, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, that's the goal. You want to pray to bring them back. Pray to bring them back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the air of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. We need to be praying for people's salvation, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And if we really have that fervent faith, we will then share our faith with them with expectation that they are going to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior too, not doubting. Sharing our faith with expectation because we prayed. Because we prayed. I have an invitation for you today. We're about to partake of the Lord's Supper. I want you to examine your heart before the Lord's Supper table. That's what it says. Confess our sins. Search your heart. See, is there anything between me and the Lord? Confess that to Him. After the Lord's Supper table, we're going to have that in just a few moments. After the Lord's Supper table, I brought some oil here. Now, it's, there's nothing magical about the oil. I think I bought it at Walmart. It's just olive oil. And although the passage isn't talking about a ceremony, we're going to do a ceremony. Uh, this isn't to replace what the doctors do. I want you to still go to the doctor if you're sick and you, you need help. I want you to do that. You go to the doctor. But when you're at the end of your rope, and you just don't have that peace inside. You've got troubles, you've got sickness, and you just say, you know, I, I want a pr I'm going to come and ask the elder. Here we have elders, the deacons will join me at, after the Lord's Supper table. And we're going to take a little oil and put it on your forehead, and we will pray over whatever trouble or sickness that you want us to pray. You just come down front, pray. If one comes, we'll do one. If everybody comes, we'll pray everybody. And I know the oil has no power. 
It's merely a symbol that says, Lord, I'm throwing this all on you. I'm trusting and believing that through prayer, you're going to answer and work this out for your glory. And then after that, we'll have a business meeting. Isn't this an exciting day? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the truths that are in it. There are some here who are seeing doctors. I'll be seeing a doctor myself tomorrow. We don't put our trust in the doctor, although we want them to do their part. We pray, O oh Lord, to you, the Lord, the healer. We're about to go to the Lord's Supper table. Lord, we don't want any illness that we brought on ourselves because we haven't examined our heart. So as we're preparing for the Lord's Supper, we'll silently in meditation and prayer to you ask you, O Lord, to bring to our recall what we need to confess that we might know there's nothing between me and my God. Bless us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.